Okay. Welcome to the Business of Race podcast, where we discuss issues of race and racism, how they impact businesses, and what organizations can do to more effectively address those issues to create a healthier working environment for everyone. I'm your host, Regina Nukokrucci, the Director of Equity for 90 Forward. And today, I am in the virtual conference room with my dear friend and LJ classmate, Charlene Jones, who is the Senior Marketing Account Director for Point Taken Communications. Welcome to the conference room, Charlene. Thank you. And thank you for inviting me. I'm so excited to uh, talk about this. And I'm, so excited. I, I'm excited to get into it. It's, this is going to be a good conversation. <laughs> but before we do that, um, let's have a little bit of fun water cooler conversation. And I know that you've been baking. Yes. And I love to bake. So what are some things that are kind of in your baking repertoire and any good baking tips for folks out there? I'll start with the baking tips. Mm -hmm. I am not someone who has come up baking, right? It was always cooking. And with cooking, there's a lot more flexibility. You know, quite frankly, you can just be a lot, I could be a lot less disciplined, mm -hmm. right? And I understand like, oh, this is too salty. I can add this. With baking, my, my pro tip, read your recipe. Double check those measurements. Because once you have committed what you're going to commit, a lot of times your fixing is, oh, this cake didn't do what it was supposed to do. Now I'm making a bread pudding. Like now I'm making a cake pudding, right? So be disciplined, read the recipe, take your time. <laughs> the price of eggs, you can't let that stuff go to waste. That is true. That is true. <laughs> and then I would say, you know, it's Easter, it's spring. I'm really, really excited about oatmeal pies. I'm very excited about um, olive oil cakes, orange ricotta cakes. Mm -hmm. Uh, so I'm, I'm really having a good time ex just exploring with things that are in season right now. So I'm, I'm, I'm really having a good time. Well, I think that's also a baking tip. One of the baking tips I would give is cook in season. It, it's cook important season. to know what is in season and to, to do that. So right now, um, my baking thing, I'm trying not to make too much of it uh, because I'm also trying to lose a little bit of weight. But I love a good strawberry shortcake, like a shortcake made from scratch. Yes, um, yes. With strawberries. And my tip for that is you make the shortcakes, cut them, put on a very thin layer of lemon curd mm. before you put the strawberries on. It just yes. takes the shortcake to a new level. And I'm so happy we're having this dialogue because I... Remember a few years back, you promised me some recipes and some cookbooks, and I never got them. So I'm going to take this time to hold you accountable. As you for should. What you owe. <laughs> okay. so. so I will. Um, we will discuss which books you want, and mm -hmm. I got you next week. And my husband will be very happy because he's like, we are running out of space for cookbooks in this house. Do something. So I will definitely live up to that. Um, so Absolutely. I, I can make that happen. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. So I pay I what you owe. Yep. Pay what I owe. I will also give one other baking tip. And I think it's an important one for people who make cheesecakes. Beat your filling and then mm. beat it some more and then beat it some more. Like, I think one of the big things why cheesecakes don't turn out right is because people do not beat their filling long enough. Mm. Uh, it, this is beyond incorporation. You've really got to get a decent amount of air whipped into the batter. Mm. So beat it, beat it, beat it again, then beat it some more. And that usually turns out a pretty good cheesecake. So Brilliant. Those are, it's so the opposite of a traditional cake mm -hmm. where it's like, just mix it until it's incorporated. And then let it leave her alone. Right, so. right. 
Yeah. And you do have to learn which of those cakes, um, no, you just need, you want less air, which one <laughs> you want more air. So <laughs> beat it, beat it. That's right. <laughs> like, That's right. like Michael Jackson, just beat it. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> All right. So um, today we want to talk about, we've had a lot of issues happening in mm-hmm. the public eye. Right. Yes. So yes. we had Black History Month um, a little while ago, and there was a big uh, kerfuffle with Target, um, where they had misidentified three civil rights icons in a Black History book they were doing, and very clearly misidentified them. Um, but we've also had other issues, for instance, Walmart in the Juneteenth issues, um, so many issues around uh, Juneteenth, but from really sort of people feeling like they were capitalizing on um, what was a very important day in Black history to having um, white um, models wearing it, it's about the freedom for me or it's my freedom day, just some, some insensitivities to what the day celebrated. But we've also had situations like H&M where they had uh, the little boy who was African-American and he had on the shirt saying coolest monkey in the jungle. So lots of times corporations can wind up in these situations where they've really taken some missteps and haven't expressed the racial sensitivity that they needed to. Mm -hmm. And I want to talk about this sort of after the fact. Obviously, there's some stuff that needs to happen on the front end. We can talk about that, too. But if you are an organization and you find yourself in one of these kinds of situations, what are some things you should do? So I thought it'd be great for us to sort of do a postmortem with each of these organizations and really look at what are some things they should have done to handle this and um, how organizations can appropriately prepare as well as pivot when something does happen. So let's start with the most recent and start with Target, right? So Target uh, gets put on blast on, I believe it was TikTok, but it's definitely on a social media platform by a woman who went and purchased the... <laughs> book and uh you know you got carter woodson is frederick douglas it, it, it was and, and these are really prominent mm-hmm. uh, figures in black history that are missed mislabeled yep Definitely. and so target apologizes they pull the product mm-hmm. they say they're going to have a conversation with the company that made them but what, how should Target have handled this? Because this is, I would almost say, this is Black History 101, (laughs) right? Um, And this product was on shelves, Mm -hmm. being sold, Mm -hmm. nobody caught it. So Mm. what what kinds of things should Target have done um, in uh, addressing this situation? Sure. So let me start off by saying congrats to 904 for launching your own Black history curriculum. What a accomplishment. I'm so very, very happy and I'm so very, very proud. So I view these issues very much like healthcare professionals view illnesses. Illnesses will occur, right? So mistakes are going to happen. But let's invest the most time and the most energy to avoiding the avoiding the illness, right? So let's let's invest the most time and the most energy avoiding these types of problems. Mm-hmm. And so I'm hoping today we can kind of talk about this in two parts, right? The actions we take to avoid getting ourselves in these situations, and then the actions we take if you find yourself in the hot seat. So let's start off with Target. Target's a big brand. They have the ability to invest in a DEIB program. 
And they've done that. What we've learned is that investing in the DEIB program may not be enough. Mm -hmm. It is not enough just to have it. Quality checks have to occur for all programs, all products, all services to actually support that program. Why have them if the arms are not long? Mm -hmm. So that means every vendor, every designer, every level of management, they have to understand what it takes to support that program and to make it feel authentic and to make sure it actually is effective. And I think that's a really important part, right? Because a lot of times corporations think about what they're doing, but they don't think about what their contractors or um, Mm -hmm. vendors are doing when in a lot of situations, especially for organizations like this that are in sales, they may actually have more of an impact on what, how clients externally experience you than the actual organization, right? Yes, absolutely. So you can't just write it off and be like, oh, you know, that that's what the vendor did. We don't really get into right. their business. Right. Uh, you really do have to know and require of mm-hmm. your vendors some work in this DEI space, right? If absolutely. this is going to be your brand, You've got to, hey, you've got to have policies, practices, and procedures that mirror ours or at least align with ours to support that. Absolutely. And in today's time where authenticity is so important to the consumer, most brands can't really afford to get that incorrect. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned sales. Right, Target is a big brand that is in sales. And of course, that is always going to be a priority. But it is important for brands of all sizes to understand that DEIB is much more than a sales strategy. Mm-hmm. Right. So we need to understand the audience beyond gender, beyond their spending power, <laughs> beyond their zip code. Right. You have to understand the stories that are attached to these bodies that you're selling to. Mm-hmm. And when you get something wrong like that, the audience feels, I felt completely invisible. Mm-hmm. And I'm, I, and I know I'm targets. Democ- I know they want to, to, to sell to me. They want me to support their, their, their brand. Right. So understanding the audience is much, much more than, you know, just under, understanding the buying power, right? There needs to be an understanding of the history, the customs, the courtesy, the language, the things that we celebrate. Those have to be the things that you celebrate as well. Well, and I think this is also a thing where you have to recognize that all situations are not created equally, right? Because history does come into play. Absolutely. Number one, I don't think you would have mislabeled George Washington versus Abraham Lincoln, Right. However, if you did, it wouldn't say the same thing as mislabeling Carter G. Woodson and Frederick Douglass. Right. Right. So understanding that there are sensitivities, especially for communities that have been marginalized, um, discriminated against, or have a history, just like, for instance, there are things that you can do um, in the heterosexual community, that if this is something with uh, members of the LGBT community, it says something different if it happens there. So you really do have to have an understanding of the historical issues that align with each community to know that if you make a mistake here, it's going to be a lot more significant than it would in maybe some other places. I, I agree with that. That that cut me a little, that cut me under my skin. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I would say when it comes to the DEIB aspect of it, ensuring that your audience understands that it's more than a sales strategy means it needs to show up as a company value. 
And when you get these things incorrect, it feels more salesy versus these are communities that we value. And moreover, diversity, equity, inclusion, belonging is a top down organizational value. Mm -hmm. This is what we actually believe and it shows up in every space that we're in. So I, I think getting those things wrong, and it's so hard to get yourself out that hole yes. <laughs> if you find yourself in it. Yes. Yes, it is. Because memories are long and <laughs> we get longer, right? right. Um, and that's the thing. It, it, a little forethought and understanding can really save you a lot of pain. Mm and um, history that you it's going to be, as you said, it's a hole that's very hard to dig out of. You know, and I would say these types of mistakes, they look and feel just like a lack of care. Uh, getting some of our iconic heroes incorrect, they look, it looks like a publishing error to a to a big organization like a Target, but for the audience, it it looks and feels a little dehumanizing almost, mm -hmm. and like an attack. Like, are our contributions do they not amount to the contributions of people of the majority? I'm just going to say it like that's almost how it feels as a consumer of color. Right. So to get those things wrong <laughs> looks like your audience is worth selling to, but I don't have to put in the time and care to actually celebrate you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And again, like I said, it, it, this wouldn't have happened with George Washington and Abraham. No. Right? So again, where you're paying attention, what you value, who you value, all of those things are communicated through mm -hmm. things like this. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, so let's let's switch gears a little bit because I want to make sure we have a chance to cover all three, right? Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> and they're and they're very different mistakes, yes. uh, but wow, the impact! Because I think Walmart, truthfully, of all the staying power, Walmart probably has it. Um, yes, because I continue to hear about the Juneteenth. Uh, red velvet ice cream, you know, that you're just going to make this the name of an ice cream. Um, you know, it's about the freedom for me, uh, putting that in sort of this colloquial expression and then having uh, a, a white model wearing it's my freedom day. There were so many Juneteenth issues mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. with Walmart. Yes. So um, now the first thing that stuck out to me in that situation was who you have at the table. Because yes. if you had anyone who was African-American at the table, when you were doing this, they would have been like, no, mm -mm, that that's not, that's not going to go well. That's not going right. to go well at all. Right. 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 So um, really representation matters and where that representation is. Yes. You have got to have some folks in decision-making roles when you put some of these things in place. Mm -hmm. and, you know, with the Juneteenth ice cream issue, Juneteenth for a long time was almost like this smaller, unrecognized holiday that only people in the community celebrated and even knew about. It was not something that people got the day off. Uh, it was it was celebrated far and wide. You would see all these, for like the 4th of July, you see sales and you see decor and it's a, it's a, it's a recognized. And so it took so long for this very, very special holiday to even be recognized by the community of the majority. Mm -hmm. Right. So that alone lets you know that if you're going to attempt these, you have to get it right. And so the ice cream felt like there were people creating these ex these products and these sales strategies that were maybe outside of the community versus people at the table 
all bodies, all communities are represented. And we talk about what does this holiday mean? What does the audience expect? Mm -hmm. What would make them feel celebrated? How do we celebrate this in a way that's not tone deaf, that's not offensive? And, and moreover, what doesn't feel like a money grab? Right. And that's exactly what that felt yeah. like. It felt like a quick, easy win, a quick, easy money grab, and a quick way to, it's like almost, I'm going to pacify like, I'm going to celebrate this in the quickest way, because I know if I don't celebrate it, I'll get backlash, but I'll mm -hmm. do it quick and easy, and I'll make a little bit of money while I right. do it. Right. And um, the audience, consumers are savvy, and consumers know <laughs> when they're being cheapened. Right. And you can't just throw uh, a little red and green and black uh, flag colors on a product <laughs> and say, oh, yeah, this is Tate, right? With no, and almost to the point that it really didn't even seem like they understood the significance of the holiday. Right. Um, and I also know that you have automated um, things, particularly with models and shirts um, mm -hmm. in, on online now, but you have to have a sensitivity to that. You know, I saw um, online, I was looking for some paraphernalia from my sorority, Delta Sigma mm -hmm. Theta, which is a historically black sorority. Mm -hmm. And then I'm looking and then there's a, a blonde headed white woman in a Delta shirt. And I'm like, okay, then no, immediately, right? This, this isn't a vendor I'm purchasing from because you don't have an understanding of who is buying this shirt and a sensitivity to that. And that's a thing where, yes, I know that's automated, but some of that you have to check it because you've got to know how that is going to come across to consumers. And I think a lot of Juneteenth with Walmart felt like discounting of me as a consumer. Discounting. And, you know, I think you're right. The optics so I'm, I'm not a part of any divine nine, but I, I have blonde hair right now. And if you saw me, phenotypically black woman with blonde hair in the red, it's the perception of it is you're celebrating every, every, every way black women show up. Right. right. You got your natural hair out. I have fake hair and it's colorful and I've been red, I've been brown, I've been black. But it looks like, oh, I understand that black women, we switch up our appearance. Mm -hmm. So it's not, it doesn't give off a tone deaf kind of message when you do that. Right. But I think for Walmart, where it was disappointing is you are a mega organization with lots of money. You can afford coaching. You can afford mentoring. You can afford hiring organizations like a 904. It exists for a reason. Mm -hmm. So that you can avoid costly, foolish mistakes. Yeah. Yeah. And like I said, and hire some folks. <laughs> hire <laughs> folks at the table who and you have a culture where people can really speak out and tell you the truth you avoid some of these missteps right off the top hire oh. these people at every level at yeah. every level there should every be someone level. and you've got to have diverse representation at decision making tables you just have to absolutely, All right. absolutely. Huh. Okay, so now let's sort of talk about what to do if it happens, right? So you've had this thing, massive thing happen. Um, so let's let's switch to H and M, okay. which there's there's one where I'm like, you all just didn't think that all the way through, and maybe, <laughs> you know, maybe I give it to you in the fact that you don't think like that, and that's wonderful, and you don't recognize the history of black people being equated to monkeys and, and that mm -hmm. be very derogatory way of referring to members of the black community. But um, it was, it was right there. It was, it was right there. And so 
because they seem to really, in my opinion, be caught unawares. The very cute little boy um, who is appearing in this ad and, you know, they did sort of this whole jungle theme. And so his said, coolest monkey in the jungle. Mm-hmm. And I mean, the, the, the backlash was swift. So yes, now you're in the middle of a firestorm, right? You didn't see it. I, I totally had a blind eye. It was an innocent mistake. And I'm, I'm going to grant them that it was an innocent mistake. Um, sure. But how do you handle it? Right. Like you've got this ad out. People are saying that it's unbelievably racist um, and you've got a black boy in it. How how do you handle that kind of PR misstep? Sure. So let's contextualize that situation. You have this beautiful black model. He's young. He has his beautiful skin. He's so handsome. And you you want the audience to celebrate him and celebrate H&M for hiring diverse models, right? Mm -hmm. It goes viral on social media because social media has that power of going viral very fast. The wrath of the consumer, you're feeling it. And what it does, it it unraveled all the hard work that H&M has done over the last eight years of really trying to diversify the talent and showing the audience that they celebrate diversity, Mm -hmm. right? So when these things happen, treat them like a crisis because that's what it is, right? I know businesses, a lot of times we think of crises, you know, warehouse fires and and things, uh, you know, untimely deaths, things that are root or void, malpractice. Mm -hmm. When you anger your consumer and you're doing that social listening and you're hearing what they're saying and you're feeling that wrath, you need to treat that like a crisis. So you implement your crisis communication strategy. You are going to prioritize some key messages, right? We're going to, one, identify the problem. Very black and white. And I think H&M actually did a very good job of Mm -hmm. identifying the problem, identifying what their key messages were. I know businesses, we have multiple things usually happening at once. When you're in a crisis, though, you silence those other priorities. Mm -hmm. We are all in on this very, very, very important (laughs) issue. Right. And And I I think I also want to mention here, because I think this is something where a lot of companies avoid it. And like, you have to name it, like name it, name that you did it. Like, oh, say it, like be very upfront about what it was. Don't hide behind it. Don't try Mm -hmm. to sort of get around it. Uh, Mm -hmm. Maybe kind of, you know, this is what happened. This was a mistake. Right. It certainly was not our intention. Um, but we we recognize how it may look, and we want you to know that is not who we are as an organization. Like, really, really name the problem and name that you understand what the problem is and apologize for that. And I think HM. You know, so H&M has had a couple problems over the last couple of years. As a result of some of the other problems, they hired their diversity inclusiveness officer. And she, when this happened, she did a very, she led the organization very well. And I loved her quote, you know, this was shocking. How could this happen? And now how do we tell the world that this was a mistake and it's not a reflection of who we are? Mm -hmm. And then continue to tell the audience that diversity is real to us, right? It's more than a sales strategy. We do these things beyond the money grab, right? These, and and we celebrate diversity down to our core. We want this to be genuine, genuine. We don't allow tokenism. We don't, we don't condone half cooked attempts at diversity and inclusion. Mm-hmm. And that 
to me, is the blueprint on how you address these problems if and when they happen. You name it, you own it, you apologize, and you communicate to the audience our value systems and what we're going to do going forward to make sure that we stay in your good graces, consumer, right? And I think this is also important where we talk about the voices that need to be at the table, right? Mm -hmm. um, I was in a meeting previously with someone and she had referred to children, um, Black children as monkeys. Uh, you all need to stop acting like monkeys and something here, right? Mm -hmm. And people were incensed and she couldn't understand why because she didn't grow up in this country. Um, and so she didn't understand the historical reference of that. Right? And especially when you're talking about a, such a global company as H&M. And truthfully, at this point, most organizations are global just from technology and the internet. You have to have multiple people at the table who can give you multiple perspectives because everything isn't offensive everywhere, but you need to know where those hot spots are. And I think that's another piece of that. Really, this is the beauty of diversity. Diversity brings a lot of different perspectives to the table. So it's not just having one person at the table, but having multiple people at the table who can speak from a variety of perspectives um, and give you insights on that. But you do have to, as you said, if you've got folks who can speak into it, take that ownership, talk about what you're going to do, how you're going to course correct mm -hmm. and move forward. Um, and that has to be done genuinely. And it's I don't want people to, it out. to walk away from this dialogue thinking that DEIB is a police system. It isn't. No. We still want creativity and free thought and edginess. You can mm -hmm. still be edgy. You can still push the envelope. Mm -hmm. But as you do that for, for H&M, that means the C-suite, the directors, the managers, your frontline staff, your contractors, down to the photographer, down to the casting uh, agency, down like those values that you said were your values are still represented as you're creative, as you make a splash. Right. I, I, I sometimes I feel like people get defensive when we talk about DEIB because they think it's, oh, this this group is meant to to come in and put parameters on everything that we are or, or to police or, or big brother us. And that's not the case. We just want to make sure that for every audience that you interact with, you do it with dignity. Right. And it also really drives um, how you engage, right? And how you are prepared. Yes. I remember uh, Cheerios got a big uh, sort of pushback when they say featured an interracial couple. They were prepared for it and they said they were going to do it because that fell in line with the values they had and this represents America, right? We want to show all facets. So I think truthfully, as opposed to uh, policing, this is really having really good DEIB structures really is more like your preparedness, readiness team, right? We see the, the, the pitfalls that could come. We want to make sure that we're making decisions that appropriately reflect who we are mm -hmm. and they will be viewed that way publicly. And we're prepared for any kind of pushback we might get because we see it coming. And I think that's where really good policies and um, guidance in the can assist you greatly. And that is phenomenal. We really want to make sure that that happens. Absolutely. And I really view DEIB as a critical arm in crisis communication when you're developing these strategies. Because to your point, when Cheerio started their revolutionary campaigns because there was the the interracial couple then they had some same sex commercials and these were commercials at peak viewing times they incorporated 
their their not only just their values and their business savvy because they understand who has the buying power and they understand that if you don't market to the audience that has the power, you're you know leaving dollars on the table. Mm-hmm. But I do feel like they just did a, such a great job of incorporating DEIB into the marketing strategy, into the crisis communication strategy, into the PR strategy. So again, DEIB is your partner. That is your business partner. Right. And they, and they were ready for it. They, and they were very not, ready. Everybody, everybody we're talking on on this list got caught by surprise. <laughs> and you, everybody did. And you, you cannot, you will not make the best business decisions if you are being caught by surprise. You won't. So if you're thinking about it in advance, because A, in advance, you've got more time. In advance, it's not crisis communication. It's That's planned right. communication, right? right? It is very specific decisions that in a situation you fully control. Whereas with all of these, you're talking about responding to a situation that is out of your control. Yes. And so if you think about having DEIB as the thing that you can hold back, it's so much better. So much better. And it's going to be better for you as an organization. It's so much better. But also, H&M allowed smaller brands to then come in and eat their lunch. Because they had the smaller brands or the competitor brands had a better understanding of how to avoid, not even just a better thing, but a better strategy on how to avoid those situations. Mm -hmm. And so when consumers are like, oh, you you get it wrong and you've gotten it wrong now a couple of times, I'm going to go ahead and look for rights. And so other brands that who have had the foresight to fully incorporate DEIB to be strategic, to understand the audience fully beyond just demographics and buying power. They get to come in and make buddy-buddy with your audience. And you position them well to do. And you you sent them their way. Yep. Yep. So, and again, I I wholeheartedly believe that... um, H&M with that issue really unraveled the the all the work that they had invested into mm-hmm. looking like an organization that celebrated diversity. Right. They really took a couple steps backwards. They did. They took some major steps backwards. And then that's money lost. Mm-hmm. That's all of the work that you did for not. And I can't even imagine for the employees who had been engaged in that work how demoralizing that was for them, right? So there's so many costs that aren't necessarily um, on the immediate face of issues like this right. when you don't do this work ahead of time. That's right. All right. So I know we're getting um, really close to time and uh, I want to be respectful of that. So we've talked about a lot of stuff today, right? <laughs> <laughs> So uh, as you think about this, what would be your one big takeaway for corporations um, who might be, who might have an issue, might be preparing for an issue, might be preparing to not have an issue? What would you say would be the one big takeaway you have for our conversation today? I don't know if I can get it down to one big takeaway. Right, because we did we covered a lot. I would say if I had maybe five talking points, if I was going to give you a a a one pager, okay, you know, please understand your audience Mm -hmm. intimately beyond you know how they spend their money in there and how they spend their free time. You know, under take the time to invest in understanding their culture. Hire the right people at the right level at your organization. So that means hire the right people at every single level. Create healthy 
work environments where everyone feels like they have the absolute right to speak and to mm -hmm. speak up and to speak out and to correct behaviors if it's needed. Because when I think about the things that we talked about today, I have a suspicion that someone felt uncomfortable, but did not fully believe that they could say something. Mm -hmm. If you have that work environment, then obviously DEIB is not a priority. <laughs> I'm just going to call a spade a spade. Right, right. Seek outside consultation if you're struggling. Again, organizations like 904, it exists for a reason. So you don't have to be in the hot seat. You don't have to lose a fraction of your consumer to someone else who got it right the first time. Mm -hmm. Again, because this is the, the business of race, right? Right. So if, if, a, if an emergency happens, treat it like an emergency, own that mistake, communicate that you know the mistake and you're owning it and you're working on fixing it and do not find yourself in that position again. Mm -hmm. So I think those are my like six, seven, maybe <laughs> key takeaways. You, know, you gave you gave all the talking points. So yes. I'm not even going to, I don't need to ask. <laughs> that was a thorough list. But I do think it is important for organizations to number one, think beyond DEIB as having employees of color or women or members of the LGBTQ, mm -hmm. LGBTQ plus community as right. employees. But this is about how people are engaged, where they are in decisions, what kinds of things get considered, policy, procedures, voices, all of those things that really, because that's how DEIB turns your company to be more productive and profitable when all of that happens. So I think that is extremely important for employers to consider. Absolutely. Incredible. Just creditable. Yeah. I trust organizations that get it right and they get it right the first time in every aspect of their marketing and their PR. I see things being done with dignity. Yep. And I agree with that. Strip of the matter. I agree with that. All right. Well, Charlene, thank you so much for joining us in the conference room today. This has been a delight. I also have on my to-do list right here to bring recipes, and yes. Books, yes. which yes. I shall deliver on. I, well, you have to now. It's recorded. No, it's, it's on, on it. <laughs> <laughs> you can't back out. The first time I didn't have proof. Now I have proof. <laughs> And I shall do it. I shall do it. But thank you so much. <laughs> thank you for having me. Have an outstanding day and keep on fighting that good fight 904 forward. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And for all of our listeners, thank you for joining us. We really appreciate you being with us. Be sure to hit that like button to help us get our content to more people and subscribe. So, you know, when we've got new content out there and, interesting conversations like this, uh, you can be notified of that. Thank you so much for joining us and we'll see you next week in the conference room. Take care.